Hi there and welcome to the next video in the uh, data ops series. So today we're going to be talking about environments. Uh, so in the previous episodes we've kind of concentrated on the automation of your deployments and that kind of stuff. And today we're just going to talk about the, uh, the actual environments themselves. So dev, QA, prod, that kind of thing. Um, so as a database person you may be familiar with uh, having different environments. So traditionally let's say on a SQL Server environment, you would have had a test system where you tested out patches. Uh, you might have had a QA system where you would try those patches in a more realistic environment. Um, or you might have done a schema change to the database in that environment. And then finally, you've got your production environment where the actual database lives uh, and where the day-to-day -day utilization of that is. So in the development world, it's a slightly different story. So we're not testing new software or, or things like that. We're testing kind of the code that we're writing, uh, the the changes that we're making. And also we need to run formal tests to work out whether we're going to actually deploy something. So always remember in this that uh, DevOps is more about governance than it is about, um, about automation. So uh, for that reason, we need to record what tests we're doing. We need to make sure that we're um, we're doing all of the things that we want to do in each of those environments so that we know when we're ready to do that release and so that we've got it recorded in case we need to look back to see what's changed. So uh, the first environment is the development environment itself, um, usually called dev in, in uh, most IT teams. So here is where you're actually going to do your work. So you would log on, for instance, to Data Factory and you'd actually be writing code or you would be changing pipelines, that kind of a thing. Now, the dev environment, uh, you're going to need some data in there um, and that data does not need to be your production data. So uh, for working on, and it kind of depends on what industry you're in. If the, if the data is very, very unimportant, then it is easier to use the real data. Uh, if you're in any kind of environment where you've got uh, data that needs any compliance or permissioning around it, it's much easier to use representative data. So you might take a subset of your uh, data set, you might create uh, some representative data that has the same schema, just so that you can work out how to do your transformations and that kind of a thing. Um, so here you're going to then uh, have your source data, which will be representative, create, say, pipelines, uh, in Databricks, again, you might be writing a, a script or a notebook against that data set and there's going to be some kind of output. Once you're happy that you've done those things, the dev environment is where you're going to uh, commit the code into the repository uh, and possibly do a pull request. So generally, the dev environment will be working on a what's known as a collaboration branch. Uh, and it's so called because that's where code is collaborated on by multiple people. So the idea here is uh, I might have a feature branch that I'm working on and that feature branch will be uh, one of the tasks in the backlog. I needed to create something new, maybe a new pipeline, maybe a new data set. So I uh, forked the code, created my feature branch, worked on my feature and there could be uh, five or ten other people in the team working on different feature branches. Some of them might be working on the same feature branch alongside of me, depending on the tooling that we're using. And then when I'm finished, I will commit back into the fe into the collaboration branch. And when the other guys in the team are finished, uh, they will then commit into their f uh, feature branches. Sorry, into the collaboration branch. Uh, the collaboration branch is then the one where we, we might run the build from. So uh, once everything has been committed, we kick off a build process and create an artifact. That artifact is the build. Um, and this is the point at the end of a sprint where we put all of the code together and it becomes a deliverable thing. From this moment on, that is the thing that we're testing. That's the thing that we're going to deploy. And that might be a new Python library, a new pipeline in ADF, uh, it could be a new notebook, it could be a wealth of things, and it could be multiple of these. So um, we may have a collaboration branch for a new Python library, and we might have a separate collaboration branch for an ADF pipeline. And then those two builds create artifacts, which we will then join together for the release pipeline. Um, so the next stage on from dev is uh, testing. So. The dev environment is very much where people go in and actually work on things. 
The testing environment is completely different. So the test environment should be mostly automated. Um, in an ideal world, you're going to have a data set that you've created for the tests you're going to run. So if I've got a Python library that adds two numbers together, I need to test, does it add those numbers together correctly? How does it respond if I put a letter in instead of a number? How does it respond if I put a negative number in? How does it respond if I put a number so large that it's not able to deal with it? And I, I should know ahead of time what I'm expecting out of these things. So, for instance, in a date range, if I put in an American formatted date into a system that is expecting a UK formatted date, does it understand that that's wrong or does it just process it and say that we're in the 13th month or something crazy like that? Um, these are the kind of things that you need to test for and because of that, you're gonna test them with data that you know is gonna create that result. So um, as you'll have seen in the other videos, when we create the test suites, we're creating that test suite with a specific test. We're asserting that this and this means this um, and quite often you'll be doing an assert to say, when I've got uh, one and I add three and I'm expecting four, then that should be uh, correct. But also I should be having tests to say, when I've got one and I add Z to it, um, that should produce an error. And that would be a successful test because we're expecting the error and therefore we're looking for that error as the test rather than seeing what the result of the thing is. Um, so once we've got the, the test environment, we run through these automated tests as you saw in the other video, we push those test results back into the product. Uh, so the test environment is not representative of your real environment. It's an environment just big enough to test the actual code that you've written. And each time you write code, in theory, you should create new tests. Uh, so once those results are pushed back into the product, uh, somebody in charge of the build process will look at those results. Hopefully they're all um, passes, once they're all passes, that it gives us the go-ahead to move into uh, the next phase of deployment. And quite often this next phase of deployment is going to be some kind of QA. This is more representative of the real environment. The data set in this environment could be your real data set. So as an example, I might have in my QA environment um, an identical data factory to the production one and a identical Databricks cluster. Um, that the code is then going to run on that against my raw data sets or against my source data sets uh, on the lake. Those are going to be the real data sets, but we might write them out into some other uh, area of the data lake, a QA testing area, for instance. Then we're going to have a suite of automated tests to run against those. So here's where we might be doing actual data integrity testing testing that we've got the right primary keys, that we've got no duplicates, all of that kind of thing. If we've got synthetic keys, are they being created correctly? Um, and we can test all of that stuff. It's not testing the code anymore. This is testing, is the data flowing through the system correctly? Are we getting the kind of results we're expecting? Um, we might also have uh, early adopter users looking at this stuff. So where we've got a new, a uh, table in a database, for instance, they might go in there and start creating uh, reports against it using that QA data data repository that's created through this process. Um, so that's used as a kind of quality measure before we push on into production. And then finally, you've got your production environment, which is actually doing the deployment. The data engineers don't really need access to this. This is for the business. Uh, and obviously, this is using the, the actual data set. And then completely separate to this stuff, you might have data scientists in your organization. And for these guys, uh, you're gonna want to have some kind of an experimentation area. You might have multiple experimentation areas, one per team. Um, and the reason we call it experimentation is because data science is not like writing code. So where you have a developer, they will write code, they'll have a plan, they will do something and have an output. Uh, with experimentation, we might need various bits of data, we might need to bring those in, do some stuff, try some things out and see what the results actually are. Um, so for this reason, you don't really want them in the, uh, the live lake because they could cause performance issues. There are actually limits on a lot of the services in all of the clouds. Um, and for that reason, you don't really want somebody accidentally copying uh, all of the data. You don't want them searching through all of the data because that could impact your production workloads. So instead, 
have an experimentation area per team, copy the data that they need or a subset of the data. So for governance purposes, it is always better to give one month of data rather than seven years worth of data, um, just because it's reducing the impact of any, any kind of data loss or, or problems. So um, have a process so that data scientists are able to get access to the data, but they don't necessarily need full access to the lake. Um, I, in an ideal world, you'd use something like Data Factory and have a request system so that they can request the job is set up to copy data across. Um, or you could have a data factory with data sets already set up for the main lake and use data wrangling to allow them to copy the data uh, off into that experimentation area, but not actually give them direct access to the lake just through the data factory interface. Uh, and in this area, they could, they're free to run their experiments. Once those are done and a model has been created, we would then use MLOps, uh, another different subject, to productionize the model. So that will then go through all the various stages of testing. We might use uh, Azure DevOps to do the deployment of that, normally as some kind of containerized service. And um, then the utilization of that is outside of the remit of kind of data scientists. We quite often would have a batch job using Data Factory or, or something like that that's going to consume that model. We might have a stream analytics job that's consuming that model for real-time data, um, but that's no longer related to that experimentation area. So hopefully that's uh, explained environments to you, uh, the various utilizations of those, who gets access to them, um, and how to kind of set these up in a sensible way so that you've got, uh, got real control over your environment and how you're deploying. So hopefully you enjoyed that. If you did, please uh, hit the thumbs up button down below uh, and also subscribe to the channel so that you get to see all of the new videos as they come out directly in your feed. And hopefully see you next time. Thanks very much.